So we're talking about joy tonight, and I thought I would define um, also healing so that we can kind of get on the same page as far as what I mean by uh, words heal, words are important, words matter. So I want to define that word. Healing, verb, to make healthy, whole or sound, to restore, to bring to an end or conclusion, as in conflicts between people or groups, to settle, to reconcile, to make well again, to mend, to repair, to strengthen. I believe words can do all of these things. Words heal, stories heal. Stories teach us, inspire us, Stories honor the past and prepare us for the future. Everywhere we go, we bring our story with us. Stories connect us. And so I want to share some of my personal stories with you. And I thought it would be good to start at the beginning. So this is where I'm from. I'm made up of East Coast hip hop and island tradition. I'm from Baptist hymns and secular jigs, tambourine playing, late night stand at the church house or my friend's house or their friend's house on the weekends. Where I'm from, there are corduroy hand-me-downs and family keepsakes, family pictures on the wall, open Bible on the coffee table. I'm from that side of town where the media only comes for blood shed, blood wasted, never for blood restored, celebrated, or regenerated. I'm from hopscotch and double dutch, from hide and go seek and Pac-Man. I'm from curry, goat, rice and peas, and beef patties, from turquoise, blue water, white sand, and dreadlocks. Reggae is in my blood. Grew up in the Pacific Northwest, a place where rain falls more than sun shines. I'm from Douglas firs and pine trees, where we walk under waterfalls, drive up windy roads, and escape to the beaches on the Oregon coast. Where I'm from, music takes away the blues. I'm from Bob Marley, Mahalia Jackson, Aretha Franklin, James Brown. I'm from Jackson 5 Records and New Edition Tapes. Where I'm from, we rewind tapes over and over and over again so you can write down the lyrics and memorize them. Where I'm from, the whole neighborhood is your family. Ladies sit on their porches looking out for you, shooing away boys like flies, calling your mama to tell her what you did before you can get home and lie about it. <laughs> Where I'm from, people ask my friend, is that your hair? And she says, yeah, it's mine, I bought it. <laughs> I'm from divorce, being passed down to children like a family heirloom. I'm from single mamas pushing strollers, praying that their babies don't make the same mistakes as them. I'm from a little, goes a long way. From sun's gonna shine after the rain. I'm from persevering souls and hardworking hands from a people destined to make it to their promised land. I'm from been there, done that, can and will do it again. Now you, tell me, where are you from? Thank you. <clears throat> I didn't know as a kid that I was processing what was happening and uh, that, that writing was healing me. But when I look back on those years, I think about my journal as a safe space that I was able to go to and reconcile what I was feeling against what was happening and the things that people weren't talking about. Uh, as a child, I wrote a lot of short stories. I wrote a lot of mysteries. When I was seven years old, I wrote a 21-page story. And my teacher said, I think you're going to be a writer one day. And I was so thrilled that she believed in me. And so I kept writing stories. And I would share them at recess. I'd share them after school. And I was hooked on getting people scared and getting them to want more. And I was always leaving the dun, dun, dun at the end, like, I'm not going to tell you what happens next until next Friday. And so I had this one mystery where the, the classroom teacher was missing. And the, the class, the students were trying to figure out what happened to our teacher. And they thought the substitute teacher had something to do with it. So they were on this mission to find out what happened. And my whole class was so into this story. So week after week, I would add on a chapter and add on a chapter. So my whole life, I was writing. And then I got in the seventh grade. And in the seventh grade, 
I've realized that my voice didn't have to just entertain or be amusing, but that I could use my voice for something more, for something good. Right before that, right before entering the seventh grade, um, in Portland, uh, Muluguetu Sara, an Ethiopian man, was beaten to death by skinheads. I was actually in the fifth grade, and I remember my teacher coming to class in tears. And she said to us, we have to do something. So she had us take out our notebooks, and she asked us to write a poem or a letter for the family. And that was the first time I was asked to use my voice to bring comfort to someone, to think about what words could do in times of tragedy, in times of pain. And so I wrote a poem. And I was selected, I don't know, I can't remember if I was like student of the month or something special that I got to be one of the students to go with my teacher to bring this gift basket of fruit and letters and poems to the family. And I remember walking away after we gave that gift to the family and I was thinking, this doesn't change anything. Muluguetu Sarah is still gone. This really horrible thing still happened. What is the point of writing this poem? But then my teacher was explaining to me, well, you took action and you spoke up and you showed this family that you cared. And I started to learn and those, those words from her took root in my heart that I could use my words to encourage, to comfort, um, to bring hope, to just stand with someone and say, I see you, to say, yeah, this hurts, this is messed up, this isn't right. I could bear witness through my words. And so in the seventh grade, I started to write poems that I felt mattered, that were about social issues. I was really into the news and watching the news and then writing a poem in response to what I saw. And I went to a predominantly white middle school. After having been in a predominantly black school uh, in the black neighborhood in Northeast Portland. So this is in the late 80s, early 90s. We're being bused to desegregate a school in Southeast Portland. And once we get to the, the school, they separated all the black kids because I think in their minds they wanted diverse classrooms. Uh, so they would put one or maybe two of us in the class at a time. Well, what that felt like was I was the only black child in a class sometimes, and I felt very isolated. So in the seventh grade, my science teacher is passing out tests that we had taken the previous day. And she walks back up to the front of the classroom and she says, I am so disappointed in all of you. You all took this test yesterday and failed but I'm going to give you a chance to retake it. I look down at my test, and I have an A. So I raise my hand, not trying to be smart or talk back to her, but I just don't want to take a test again. So I raise my hand, and I say, do I have to take the test over? And she turns her body away from me and talks to all the white students in class and says, and this is why I'm so disappointed in you. You all let Renee Watson come over here from Northeast Portland and get a better grade in science than you? Now, I'm in the seventh grade. I've been taught to respect adults, not to talk back. I know that what she's saying is not okay, but I can't quite name it. I don't know words like microaggression or macroaggression. Uh, and my friends, my peers, they don't know what to do either. So I sit while they take the test, swallow my tears, and I just hold that for the rest of the school day. Fortunately, I have a mama <laughs> that is the kind of mama that when you go home and tell her what went down, she was at the school the next day. And I was not in that meeting. I don't know what was said, but I was taken out of that class. I look back on that moment as a time when I've, a, an early memory of realizing that people had expectations of me based on where I lived, what I looked like. And my journal that was all full of these stories about other people's troubles and political poems became very personal of wanting to be seen, wanting to be validated for who I am. So in the seventh grade, I started writing poems about me. 
and letters that I wish I could have given to people, but I was too shy to do that. So I wrote to this teacher. I wrote to people who I felt had low expectations of me, people who would talk about my neighborhood, who had never been to my neighborhood, but were afraid of it and thought that there was only ugliness there when there was also so much beauty. And so I think that in those early years of writing in my journal and experiencing living in the Pacific Northwest as a black girl, all of that prepared me for the types of books that I write. I don't shy away from writing about race and the intersections of race and class because I know that our young people are seeing it and experiencing it even if they can't name it. And I, I have a feeling that they wanna talk about it and that it's the adults who may be a little afraid or intimidated to talk about it. So I hope that my books um, serve as a way for young people and adults to come together and talk about these issues. Um, so a lot of people ask me, do you write about your stories? Like, is this really just you? And it's not, and it is, right? So in piecing me together, Jade is not Renee. Renee is not Jade. But I understand what she's going through. I know what it's like to feel invisible. I know what it's like to have people say that your home is dirty, that there's nothing good that can come from that neighborhood. And I know what it's like to say, well, there might be some brokenness, but there's beauty too. And so I want to read a little bit from Piecing Me Together and think about this idea of how do we remake ourselves when the world wants to break us? And how do we, through children's literature, help young people gain tools to be able to put themselves back together when they feel broken? This is a scene in the book when Jade is with her mentor and the other mentors and girls. So she's one of 12 students who've been selected to be in this program, and she really doesn't want to be in this program. Um, she thinks they're all stuck up and that they look down on her. She's in this really fancy house in this scene, so she's a little just intimidated by all of the grandeur of the space. The young girls have been asked to write down a question that they have that maybe they don't want to ask out loud. And they put it in a bag, shake it up, and they're going to go through all these questions. And so far, the questions have been a little superficial about makeup tips and dating advice. And Jade is like, look, I got real world problems. So if we're going to be here talking, let's talk about some things that matter. So she's trying to think of her question to ask. And she's not so sure these women can answer her question. This is piecing me together. Sabrina ends the night with a talk about following our dreams and believing in ourselves. You have to believe you are worthy of love, of happiness, that you are worthy of your wildest dreams coming true. When she says this, so many thoughts rush through my mind. I am thinking about how mom had plenty of dreams, and EJ is not short on self-confidence, and Lily has known she wants to be a poet since we were in middle school, so it can't just be about believing and dreaming. My neighborhood is full of big dreamers, but I know that doesn't mean those dreams will come true. I know something happens between the time our mothers and fathers and teachers and mentors send us out into the world telling us the world is yours and you are beautiful and you can be anything and the time we return to them. Something happens when people tell me I have a pretty face ignoring me from the neck down. When I watch the news and see unarmed black men and women shot dead over and over, it's kind of hard to believe this world is mine. Sometimes it feels like I leave home a whole person, sent off with kisses from mom who is hanging her every hope on my future. By the time I get home, I feel like my soul has been shattered into a million pieces. Mom's love repairs me. Whenever mom's cooking is simmering on the stove and EJ's music is filling every inch of the house and I am making my art, I believe everything these women are saying about being worthy of good things. Those are the times I feel secure, feel just fine. I look in the mirror, and I see my dad's eyes looking back at me, my mom's thick hair, thick everything. And that's when I believe that my dark skin isn't a curse, that my lips and hips, hair and nose don't need fixing, that my dream of being an artist and traveling the world isn't foolish. Listening to these mentors, I feel like I can prove the negative stereotypes about girls like me wrong. 
that I can and will do more, be more. But when I leave, it happens again, the shattering. And this makes me wonder if a black girl's life is only about being stitched together and coming undone, being stitched together and coming undone, being stitched together and coming undone. I wonder if there's ever a way for a girl like me to feel whole. Wonder if any of these women can answer that. So I believe that there can be joy and sadness at the same exact moment. Uh, Jade is experiencing some of the best things that happened to her while experiencing some of the worst things that are happening to her. And I want our young people to know that it's okay to hold both things, that you can celebrate and critique something, that you can love someone and also be disappointed in them, that you can love your neighborhood and also want some things to change about it. There's a quote that uh, I love by Maya Angelou that says, my great hope is to laugh as much as I cry. I wanna say it one more time, my great hope is to laugh as much as I cry. I appreciate this sentiment because it assumes there will be a lot of tears. It's almost like she is guaranteeing that for herself and that the hope is that there will also be joy. This quote inspired so much of the book, What Mama Left Me, and I'd like to read a little bit of that. Serenity's mother has died at the hands of her father. She is now living with her religious grandmother. And in this scene, she's just skipped her counseling session. And grandma does not play. So she finds out that Serenity didn't go. And they're having a conversation about that. Um, something you should know is that cooking is a big deal in this family, especially baking. And so the grandmother is going to mention some of that because that's something that they enjoy to doing together. I am not sure how grandma makes it up the stairs without me hearing the floor creak, but here she is at my door. She doesn't knock. She barges in. Serenity, I just got off the phone with Ann. Grandma's eyes are sharp knives. I look away. Why didn't you go to your session, she asks. I'm thinking maybe if I sit here long enough without saying anything, she will just punish me and we won't even have to talk about it. Do you hear me? I asked you a question. Grandma closes the bedroom door, sits on my bed, and asks me again, why didn't you go to your session today? I don't want to talk to Ann anymore. Why not? There's no point, I answer. What do you mean there's no point? Grandma starts fussing at me. She goes on and on about Anne being a person and how it's not fair to just leave her sitting in an office waiting for me. She has feelings too. She fusses and fusses and fusses. I just can't believe you would do something like this. What were you thinking? Why would you, you wanna know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking that talking to Anne is stupid and so is talking to God. Neither of them really care about me. They just like to see me cry. I can't stop the words from coming out now. I don't ever want to go back to see Ann, and I never want to go back to church again. I expect Grandma to hush me, but instead, she just lets me talk. She lets me scream and yell about how unfair it is that I don't have a mother when I loved her so much, and how Ricky died when really he was just doing the right thing by sticking up for a friend. I tell Grandma that I am so mad and angry that every time things start looking good, they go bad. It's not fair, Grandma. It's not fair. My eyes are so full of hot tears, I can barely see. Grandma holds me and wipes my tears away with her plump hands, and now I can see that she is crying with me. Serenity, baby. Who told you life was going to be fair? Well, what's the point? What's the point of going to church and praying and doing right if nothing good is ever going to happen to you, baby? If you try to tally it up like that, you'll never have peace or joy. You don't get rewarded right away for good deeds. And every time something bad happens, doesn't mean God is out to get you. Grandma rubs my back and I cry softer and softer. The peace comes over me like at the end of a rainstorm. Grandma looks me in my eyes and says, now, 
I know I haven't baked in the kitchen for a while, but you do remember the main ingredients for a cake, don't you? I really don't want to talk about her cookbook right now, but I say yes. And what are they? I sit back against my pillow and face grandma. Well, you need eggs, flour, oil, I tell her. Right, grandma says. Now tell me, would you ever eat a raw egg? No, grandma. I have no idea why she's asking me this. Would you ever take a spoon and eat spoonfuls of flour or drink a cup of oil? I am grossed out just thinking about it. Grandma, that's nasty. Exactly. Those things don't taste good by themselves, do they? No. But what happens when you mix all those ingredients together and bake it in the oven with something sweet? It tastes good, I answer. Grandma smiles, real good if I'm baking it. Then she takes my hands. Serenity, baby, it's the same way with life. The deaths of loved ones, friends hurting your feelings. These are all kinds of things that happen in life that don't feel good. They're just downright awful. But I know from experience that all those hard, hurtful things get combined with the good, joyful things, and somehow the good outweighs the bad. Grandma shifts her weight and makes herself more comfortable on my bed. You know how many times I've cried in my life? So many, I can't count. Then Grandma smiles. But guess what? I can't count the laughs either. I've had plenty of both, Grandma says. It's been a tough year, Serenity Baby. I know. But it won't always hurt this bad. Grandma lets go of my hands. The next time you look at a cake with all that pretty frosting, I want you to think about what it took to get it to look that good. She makes eye contact with me. It's the same with life. You never know what not-so-sweet things have happened in someone's life, even the life you think is perfect. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Grandma stands up and walks to the door. Now, I'm not going to make you talk to Ann, but... If you don't want to go back, you need to let me know so I can cancel it and let her know. Do you need to think about it before you make your final decision? Yeah, I tell her. Okay, we'll talk about it tomorrow. Grandma says goodnight and closes my door. I change my clothes and get into bed. I can hardly sleep thinking about what Grandma said. I know my grandma isn't with, I know my mama isn't with me, but right now it feels like she is. I hear her telling me, I told you so, and she did. When I was younger, Mama would read to me at bedtime. I always wanted her to skip to the end so I could know what would happen, especially if there was a scary scene. I wanted to make sure that the characters would be okay. Mama would say, you can't truly enjoy a happy ending if you skip through all the bad parts. <clears throat> So I read that because I wanted to give an example of a character that's going through something pretty devastating, but learning how to cope with it in healthy ways. I don't write books for children to help them escape reality. I write to help them cope with it, help them deal with it. And so I, you know, I, the truth is that our young people are going through a lot, and they're witnessing a lot. And Serenity has the worst thing that happens to her. And I wanted young people to have an example of how can you be angry and sad and own those very real emotions, but also deal with it and talk about it and lean on the people who care about you. I also wanted young people to have an experience of reading the many ways that black men show up for their families. Uh, the father in this book is so horrible. He is the worst kind of man. He is the stereotypical black man that sometimes shows up in movies and books. And I know that that person is real, but I also know that so many men who are not that. So I want to be responsible as an author and make sure that if I'm going to have that negative character, that there's someone that counteracts that and shows um, the many ways people exist. And so Danny, the, her brother, is learning masculinity in a different way from his grandfather, who is one of my favorite characters in the book. Uh, the grandparents are pastors, and 
they have now taken Serenity and Danny to live with them. And so both Serenity and Danny are just experiencing a whole new way of living. They've never seen a man wash dishes. They've never seen a man apologize or cry. And so in this scene, this is the beginning of them seeing that things are gonna be a little different at their grandparents' home. We've been back from the retreat for a week now. It's Saturday morning and I wake up to the sound of slamming doors and yelling voices. Grandpa is standing at the foot of the steps screaming at Danny. Young man, get back down these stairs right now. I hear Danny open the door, but he doesn't go downstairs. He is standing in the hallway yelling back at Grandpa. What do you want? You already said no. What else is there to talk about? Danny has found new boldness today. I get out of bed and go into the hallway. What's the matter? Danny snaps at me. None of your business. Leave me alone. Grandpa keeps fussing. Danny, you don't walk away from me when I'm talking to you, and you don't slam doors and throw tantrums in this house. You understand? Yes, but what I don't understand is why I can't get the shoes. Grandpa sighs. Didn't I just buy you shoes at the beginning of the school year? Yeah, but those are ugly. Danny, the answer is no. No new video games, no new shoes. Grandpa starts to walk away. You ought to be grateful for what you have. There are kids in this world who wish they had even one pair of shoes. Grandpa is out of sight now. He's walked toward the kitchen, still mumbling about how ungrateful the youth of today are and how materialistic we've become. Danny is mumbling too. My daddy would have got him for me, he says, but not low enough because Grandpa is making his way up the steps before Danny can say anything else. What did you say? Grandpa is short of breath because he is talking and walking up the steps at the same time. You're right. Your father would have got you everything you wanted, but son, I'm going to give you what you need. When Grandpa reaches the top of the stairs, Danny backs up. Fear has come now and erase all that boldness and attitude. He flinches and puts his hands out to protect his face. What are you flinching for? Why are you jumping back? Grandpa is yelling loud. His voice is like thunder, an unexpected roar. Now Grandma is at the foot of the steps. James, leave him be. Leave him be, she says. Why did you flinch up like that, huh? Answer me, James. Grandma is coming up the stairs, too. Answer me. Danny doesn't sound angry anymore. Now his voice is soft and low. I thought you were going to hit me. Grandma is upstairs now. The hallway seems tiny with the four of us standing here. The silence is loud. No one speaks or moves until Grandma puts her hand on my grandpa's back. James, leave him be. Grandpa gently touches Danny on his shoulder. Like I said, I'm not your father. He keeps his hand on Danny's shoulders and it must feel like a heap of coals because Danny's anger felt melts away, and now he is crying. Grandpa repeats himself, son, I'm not your father. I'm not like him. Grandma gives me a look, and so I go back in our room. I hear her walking down the stairs. Danny and Grandpa are still in the hallway. Neither of them say a word. All I can hear is the sound of crying from both of them. So again, I want characters to feel real, situations to feel real, but I also don't want it all to be pain and struggle. So we are talking about joy tonight, and I want to share some joy that's in this book as well, where kids can just be kids, right? You know, we're not the things that happen to us. And sometimes I think it's great that we have spaces where young people can process what's going on in their lives and where we use books to help them cope. But I think it's also okay to just say, let's just have fun today. What do you like to watch on TV? What's your favorite music? And just let them be young people so that they're not defined just by tragedy or struggle. So let's talk about joy. Let's talk about resistance. I want to say, you know, I believe joy is not happiness. Happiness is brought by external things. Joy is internal. 
Joy does not change when circumstances change. Happiness does. Dr. Robert Hayton describes joy as unreasonable happiness because it doesn't seem to need a reason. It is a happiness that is based on nothing. In other words, it doesn't need a cause or an effect in order to exist. Joy is an inner knowing, a kind of peace that anchors the soul when chaos is erupting. I love the saying, joy is an act of resistance. To be able to laugh and love and trust and give and celebrate in times like these is its own miracle. Poems and poets like Homage to My Hips and Homage to My Hair by Lucille Clifton and The Reasons I Love Chocolate by Nikki Giovanni, Gary Soto's odes about food and tennis shoes taught me how to hold on to my joy, how to say I am not the tragic things that happen to me or my people, so many writers and poets whose work I love and teach wrote about beauty and love and the mundane everyday things during the worst things that were happening in our nation. Langston Hughes, Gwendolyn Brooks, Maya Angelou. Yes, they wrote about struggle. They also celebrated life, put words to the simple things as if to say, this hate will not steal my laugh. This sadness will not destroy my soul. It is easy to laugh and smile when everything is well. Sometimes the laugh that comes through struggle, the dance that comes while mourning, is the most profound. I try to have a balance of struggle and joy in my work. And in this scene, kids are just being kids. So we're going to read a scene. I'm going to read a scene from Sunday school class. Anybody go to Sunday school class when you were younger? This is the moment that happens right before the church service, and they are in the middle school group having class. Miss Valerie stands at the front of the room. Before we begin class, I just want to remind everybody that there's no gum chewing in church. Two girls and a boy spit their gum out in the garbage can. I slide mine to the back on the right side. Miss Valerie turns the lights off. The DVD starts, and a voice comes out that says, Children, do you know what Ephesians 6 says? It admonishes you to obey your parents. Maria sighs. This is so stupid. The DVD starts playing in slow motion, and then it skips ahead. Miss Valerie turns the lights on and goes to the DVD player. I don't know what's wrong with this thing, she says. She takes the disc out and wipes it on her skirt. Then she puts it back in. We start watching the DVD again. This time, we get farther. A young boy is told by his parents not to ride his bike past a certain point, but he does it anyway. The little boy is in the middle of the street when a car comes speeding by. The DVD starts skipping forward again. Miss Valerie turns the lights on. OK, what is going on here? She searches her desk for the remote control and realizes it's not there. Who has the remote? Miss Valerie stands with her hands on her hips. There are small sounds of giggling from behind me, and I turn around. A row of boys are laughing, and all of them have their hands in awkward places. In their pockets are tucked under their folded arms. I look at Danny, who is sitting in the last row, next to a boy named Ricky. Ricky is the same age as Danny, but he is so tall that he looks older than all of us. His shirt is wrinkled and tucked halfway in his khaki pants. His hair is braided straight back in cornrows, and his lips are shining like he put on too much chapstick. Danny and Ricky are hiding their hands, too. The only difference between them and the other boys is they are the only ones not laughing. I know it's them. I am very disappointed in all of you, Miss Valerie says. She is trying to sound older than she is. She is not a real teacher. She is in college and only graduated from high school last May. She makes us put Miss in front of her name because it shows respect, she says. But I think she just wants to seem important. Do I have to check everyone's hands? Miss Valerie starts walking through the rows of metal chairs. Those of us in the front hold our hands up with all 10 fingers stretched wide. By the time she gets to the back, I feel Maria tap me on my leg. I look down, and she is tapping me with the remote. It's been passed from the back row. I turn around, 
and say to her, I can't get, I don't want this. Take it. No, 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 no. Don't give it to me. Put it on her desk, Maria whispers. No, my grandmother can find out. I could get, just do it. I take it and run on my tippy toes to Miss Valerie's desk. I put it next to her Bible and rush back to my seat before she can turn around to see me. Maria nudges me, stop looking so guilty. <laughs> Two girls, Karen and Sabrina, are sitting at the end of our row and they can't stop laughing. Soon we are all laughing and I wonder, does God think this is funny? <laughs> Miss Valerie comes to the front of the room and begins to lecture us about playing in the Lord's house. One of you has the remote and I know it. You mean that remote, Maria says. She points to Miss Valerie's desk. Miss Valerie looks at the desk, then back at us. I'm telling your parents, she says. It's been there the whole time, Maria says. Then Deacon Harris walks by, ringing the bell, and the whole class cheers because we realize we have just wasted the whole hour. We get up from our seats and head to the door. Wait a minute, Miss Valerie says. Someone has to share during the wrap-up session. We all get quiet. We have nothing to share because we didn't do anything. Didn't think about that, did you? Miss Valerie almost smiles at the fact that now the same kids who just drove her wild will be in trouble because they have nothing to share with their parents. Ricky shouts, well, if we don't have anything to share, they'll think you're not a good teacher. Miss Valerie rolls her eyes and grabs a picture off the wall. Whose is this? She shows it to all of us, like kindergarten teachers show picture books as they read. I raise my hand. Good. You're sharing today. What? What am I supposed to say? Talk about why you do this picture, what it means to you, what Bible story inspired it. I don't know. Say whatever you want. Miss Valerie hands me the picture, and we all leave class. During the wrap-up session, when Deacon Harris asks, who's sharing from the middle school class? I realize that I am nervous and that I really don't want to do this. And I think how Danny and Ricky and the rest of the class owe me, Miss Valerie too. I stand at the front of the congregation and say, I drew this picture after we had a lesson about heaven because it sounds like a place I want to go. I hold my picture up and show it to everyone. It's a picture of heaven, streets paved with gold, silver gates, Grandma looks at it and she is smiling and clapping and everyone joins her. I colored the angels brown, like my mama. <clears throat> so I like to just let kids be kids. And I also wanna let young people have a moment on the page to raise their voice and to say who they are. Uh, again, thinking about the character being an example, hopefully for the reader who's reading the book. So in Watch Us Rise, the way that joy is resistance is through char a character named Jasmine, who is a plus size girl, dark skin, and very proud of her body and not ashamed of it. And she raises her voice in this joyous way to say, I'm here, I'm beautiful, this is who I am, I'm not gonna apologize for taking up space. And these are the stories I bring with me. So this is a definition poem from the book that she writes. It's as if you would look into the dictionary and see uh, um, hair and tell the story of your hair. I always tell young people, you bring stories with you. In this room right now, so many stories are here, memories, favorite songs, favorite foods, recipes that have been passed down generation to generation, fears, questions. And I, when I'm teaching poetry, say to young people, all of that is welcomed here. And that's all the material we're gonna create from. So this is a definition poem written in Jasmine's voice, and it's called This Body. This Body, a definition poem. Skin, noun. One, sensitive, dry. See Dove soap, oil of Olay, shea butter. See middle school pimples plumping up the night before picture day, always on the chin or nose. Two, dark. See slave. See Negro. See age seven. See yourself playing on the playground when a white girl says, you must eat a lot of chocolate since your skin's so brown. Hair, noun, 
one. See assimilation. See smoke from the hot comb crochet in the air, burning a sacred incense. See your mama parting your hair, bringing iron to nap. Hold your ear, baby, she tells you, so she can press Africa out. When black girls ask, is it real? Say yes. When white girls ask, can I touch it? Say no. Two. See natural. Reference Angela Davis, Dorothy Pittman Hughes, comb yours out, twist yours like black licorice, like the lynching rope used on your ancestors' necks. Let it hang free. Hips, noun, one. Reference Lucille Clifton and every other big girl who knows how to work a hula hoop. See Beyonce, dance like her in the mirror. Don't be afraid of all your powers too. You will not fit in most places. Do not bend, squeeze, contort yourself. Be big, brown girl. Big, wide smile. Big, wild hair. Big, wondrous hips. Brown girl, B. This body, too. My body is perfect and imperfect, and black and girl, and big and thick hair and short legs, and scraped knee, and healed scar, and heart beating, and hands that hold, and voice that bellows, and feet that dance, and arms that embrace, and my mama's eyes, and my daddy's smile, and my grandma's hope, and my body is masterpiece, and my body is mine. Sometimes joy comes from knowing you have an extended family. I know that some of the readers who read my books don't have the mom and the dad and the grandpa in the stories that I'm reading and writing and so I want them to think about their ancestors. I want them to think about artists who've come before them, to find family and people that are handmade and maybe not biological. So in some places more than others, Amara definitely has her family. She's learning that history and figuring out where she comes from literally. But she's also learning her cultural history, where her roots connect. And she's drawing strength from that as well. So I'm going to close. I'm going to read a little bit from uh, some places more than others, and end with a poem from Piecing Me Together. But I wanted to make sure you guys get to hear a little bit from Amara, who is in Harlem. She has begged to go on this trip, and she finally gets to go. And she has her camera. She's such a tourist. And her cousins are so annoyed, because this is their home. So they're like, whatever. Yeah, 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 it's Times Square. Yeah, 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 it's the statue. You know, They don't care about all the things that she's like, I've never seen this before. And so she's never been to a place like the Schomburg Center, which if you have not been, you should go, because it is a wonderful, wonderful, necessary place. So she's going there for the first time. And um, this is what happens when she arrives. She's looking at the cosmogram on the floor, and her grandpa is telling her the history of this space, which, if you don't know, was created by Mr. Schomburg because he was told as a child that black people didn't have a history, that they hadn't contributed anything to society that was good. So he searched and researched and found all the things that we have done. And this place is a, a research library that houses all this information. They're standing at the cosmogram that has a poem by Langston Hughes. People walk by, coming and going. The elevator dings, voices echo, footsteps tap against the tile, but I don't move. I breathe in this place. Think of all the activists and artists, politicians and preachers and teachers who've walked in here. Think how Grandpa Earl said this place was created with me in mind. I wonder if my ancestors saw me coming. How far into the future could they imagine? Just the idea that people like Harriet Tubman, Adam Clayton Powell, and Langston Hughes were thinking that one day someone like me would exist in a free world makes my heart pound, my eyes water. I study the cosmogram, which looks like a map, like a blueprint of all the places black people have been 
all the places we bring with us. I think about what Mr. Rosen said when he told me, some things you won't be able to put in your suitcase. Some things are intangible, and yet you carry them with you. Now, I know what he means. So that's just a little, little taste of some places more than others. Finding home, finding place, and maybe a place that isn't yours. She doesn't belong to Harlem, but she belongs to Harlem, and Harlem is hers. Uh, I want to close by reading a poem, the, the closing poem in Piecing Me Together. We've talked about joy being a miracle, the fact that we can laugh in times when there's such great tragedy happening, in times when we're frustrated about what's going on in our world, in our nation. How do we hold on to joy? How do we remember the things that are worth remembering to keep us going? How do we stitch ourselves back together? When I was writing Piecing Me Together, I was writing that to the backdrop of Sandra Bland, um, all of that summer of great loss in our nation at the hands of police officers, um, and the, the stories of women weren't being told as much, so I was digging to find, well, what's happening to black women and their bodies? So this poem celebrates and honors the women that were lost, and also the young girls, that those videos that went viral, about the girls at the swimming pool who were dragged by police officers, a girl sitting in her classroom who got dragged out of her desk. All of that made it into the book because I was like, I cannot write about black girls without writing about what's happening to their bodies. And so even if that's not your story, I want you to just think about the things you've been through, the good, the bad. I want you to think about how it is that you're still standing. You're still here. I want you to think about getting a journal, writing your own story, sharing your story with someone. I tell young people all the time, there's one thing that you can be an author, but you can be a writer. <laughs> Writers write. You don't have to publish what you write. You can still just write to get it out, to release it, to share it, to put on record your own story. So many times people are trying to speak for us on our behalf. I think it's important to tell your own story. This is Black Girls Rising. Are black bodies sacred? Are black bodies holy? Our bodies our own? Every smile a protest, every laugh a miracle. Piece by piece we stitch ourselves back together this black girl tapestry, this black body that gets dragged out of school desk slammed onto floor, tossed about at poolside, pulled over and pushed onto grass, arrested, never to return home, shot on doorsteps, on sofas while sleeping and dreaming of our next day, our bodies, a quilt that tells stories of the middle passage, of roots yanked and replanted, our bodies, a mosaic of languages forgotten, of freedom songs and moaned prayers, our bodies, no longer disregarded, objectified, scrutinized, our bodies, our own. Every smile, a protest, every laugh, a miracle, our bodies rising, our feet marching, legs dancing, our bellies birthing, hands raising, our hearts healing, our voices speaking up, our bodies, so black. So beautiful, here, still, rising, rising. Thank you.